Hey everyone, welcome to Market Power. Today we have a little bit of an experiment. I'm gonna be talking with Jason Crawford, the man behind the blog, The Roots of Progress. This is a little bit different for me. We're doing an interview style video but I really enjoyed what we did here. I, we're gonna talk about what progress means and how economic growth contributes to it. We're gonna talk about how Jason's project started and how it evolved. And also we're gonna talk about how he goes through his research process in case you're interested in doing a similar project. I really enjoyed this conversation. It's something new and experimental, so let me know in the comments below if you enjoyed it. And also, if you're interested in joining a community of people interested in and excited about economics, be sure to subscribe. Let's go see what Jason's up to. I'm joined today by Jason Crawford, who is the author of Roots of Progress. Um, Jason, can you just tell us what Roots of Progress is about? Yeah, sure. Uh, the Roots of Progress is a blog that covers the history of technology and industry and more broadly, the story of human progress. The goal is to help us uh, appreciate the modern world, the world that we live in, how far we've come from you know, the standard of living and quality of life we enjoyed just a few hundred years ago, and what the major developments were that, that got us here, and kind of what were the problems that we, that we faced in living, and how did we solve them? So when you, so you, when you said all those kind of things, like, I think that's already answered my next question, but if someone were to just ask you, What's progress or how do you define progress? What yeah. do you think? I define progress by a humanistic standard, the standard of human life, happiness, health and flourishing. So, you know, progress means more wealth, uh, more uh, technology, more science, better understanding of our world, deeper knowledge, uh, more industrial capacity and, you know, ability to create wealth. Uh, it also means there's also social progress, right? Progress means more peace, more freedom. Uh, more universal rights for everybody. It's more than economic growth, I guess. If, if someone says, well, progress is economic growth, what's your response? My, so my conception of progress is broader than that. When I think about progress, I think about all the things that are good for human life and flourishing. So I think about economic growth, certainly, and, and technology as part of that. I also think about progress in science, and, uh, and I think about progress in, in society, in government and morality as well. I think the last, to, to truly understand the story of human progress, you actually have to understand all three of those things because those three stories, uh, economic and technological progress, uh, scientific progress, and uh, social progress, all three of those are actually tightly intertwined over the last few hundred years in the story of human progress. Yeah, I would agree. It seems like, you know, as economic growth has been accompanied with progress on all those fronts. I guess a lot of people critique economic growth by saying there are limits. Eventually, you know, a lot of times economic growth has costs. And do you see progress as balancing those costs? Like you can't, if we have progress, it's not economic growth that then deteriorates other things. Progress is these moving together or at least none of them moving backwards. Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, the, the term progress, you know, you can have progress in one limited area that might maybe not be a good thing overall. But uh, I think you know, when you when you want to look at human progress overall, you do want to look at it from a, from an overall metric, uh, from an overall perspective, right? You don't want to just look at one area in isolation. So certainly, yes, when we look at economic progress, we also need to say, what was, uh, sure, what did what did we give up, if anything, for this? Um, but I think when you step back and you look at, certainly when you look at the last few hundred years of human history, say, you know, since the 16 or 1700s to today, the story is one of enormous progress on pretty much every front. Uh, I think there's no question that the, the net progress was, was very strong, that progress on the whole was very good for all of humanity. Well, you started this three years ago. It looked like March 2017, but you said you'd already been focusing on that for a few months. So we're about at that three-year anniversary. Why did you start this blog, this project? Uh, I started it in part, in part just because I'm highly intellectually curious. But in part, my, my motivation was to really revisit the foundations of my own worldview, my politics and philosophy. Uh, it was in, in thinking about those things, I realized that a lot of what I care about and think is important in the world and, and in society comes from this keen appreciation of the story of human progress, knowing how, uh, how much it sucked to live just a few hundred years ago, how, how much uh, worse off pretty much everybody was, and how far we've come since then. 
Uh, and knowing that that was an enormous human achievement, that it was unprecedented in history, that for thousands or really tens of thousands of years, there was you know, very little progress overall. And then suddenly in the last couple of centuries, an explosion of progress. And so uh, I was motivated to, uh, to learn more about this story. Uh, I figure, okay, if, you're, if your whole worldview is kind of based on seeing this uh, story of progress as crucial to the human race and, and everything is about wanting to keep it going and even accelerate it, then I should really understand that story. I should really go back to the beginning. I should learn it. Um, you know, when I asked, when I thought to myself about, say, the Industrial Revolution, that yeah. stood in my mind as a time of, you know, before I began this project, it stood in my mind as a really important time in history, uh, a time when, when a lot of, you know, great achievements happen, things, human you know, standard of life got a lot better. And yet, if you asked me or most people today, I think, what was the Industrial Revolution? Uh, gee, I don't know. It was that time in the... 1800s maybe when there were like a lot of inventions and stuff right you know that's about the and there were trains i guess and <laughs> you know that's like about the level of detail maybe that i'm exaggerating slightly but not much i think that's about the level of detail that i or most people could kind of give you about this and that's not enough uh, right. i think really appreciate how far we've come uh, you've got to know a lot more than that in a lot more detail and so that was what i set out to do well, I agree. I think one of the, so I teach an economic history class and one of the ways I introduce is I bring up like the Great Depression. Hey, here's like one of the most significant events in American economic history. We had we lost about a third of GDP. You guys have all heard of it, but what caused it? And, you know, it's hard to come up with a story just like the Industrial Revolution, right? It's just these, these major things. But what I really like about it is you can, people have been exposed to history throughout their entire education. You sit down as a kindergartner, you're learning about the first Thanksgiving, and you know it's a sanitized -ish version of history, but you're at least getting introduced to it. But you don't get a, the, a lot of economics. Uh, maybe you're getting some philosophy, you get a little bit of that, some government and politics. But then to go and say, let's take that history and let's learn about these deeper concepts about economics, uh, economic growth, technological growth, now all of a sudden you're getting people really excited about those aspects of history. Yeah, people are exposed to history from early, that's true. I think most people don't retain or absorb much. That's uh, good. Right? I think they, a, a lot of history, and I think this is the fault of history teaching today, I think, uh, and history writing, I think a lot of it just kind of washes over you, and then, you know, maybe you cram enough to remember it for the test, but I don't think most people take, you know, retain much of that as a package that they can take with them for the rest of their lives, and and actually rely on that knowledge for to inform them about anything. And during history class, a lot of history is about politics, it's about war, it's about kingdoms and empires. Uh, it is not a lot, typically, not a ton of focus on uh, science and technology, on increases in the standard of living. You know, you're lucky if you get one unit on that. And I think that's an incredibly important story that just needs more weight. More yeah. Well, when you started this... Uh, three years ago, your posts were like very short. They were kind of more stream of consciousness or they were like, just like, here's a quote from a book and here's like one or two lines commentary from you. And now you're writing like big long form essays. Like what caused this shift to go from that first phase of the, the blog to what it is today? Yeah. In the beginning, I, so this, this whole thing, I like to say began as a reading list and then it became a hobby and then it became an obsession. <laughs> uh, before, it, before it became, and then it became my full time uh, thing. Uh, so in the beginning, I was keeping the setting the bar very low for myself. I said, "I'm going to blog about this, but I I don't want to turn it into a huge production. I honestly don't care who or how many people read this. It'll probably just be a few of my friends. That's right. really cool." And so I just put out little notes and thoughts as as they came to me. Um, and then, you know, the, the evolution towards more long form writing, I think, uh, came somewhat naturally, spontaneously. Uh, there was one book that I read that uh, it was The Alchemy of Air by Thomas uh, Hager or Hager. Uh -huh. That, uh, you know, I, I read this book and it was so well told. The story was so well told that I walked away with it with pretty much the entire story summarized in my head and ready to be retold. And I'm sure I retold it to a number of folks over dinner. My wife probably got tired of hearing me <laughs> the story of this book over and over to all our friends. 
so I just wrote it as a blog post, and uh, it was very easy to write because the the story was so uh, the, the the logical through line of the story was so natural. Mm. And so that came out as one of my longer posts to date at the time, but also I felt one of my more one of the posts I was more satisfied with, and that my friends seemed to react to better and and really liked. Okay. Uh, so that got me to do some longer form stuff. I think another um, another thing that happened was I just personally got more interested in telling the complete story of a technology. So I read a book on concrete, for example, and cement. And when I uh, when I finished that, I really wanted to you know be able to kind of tell. Okay, let me tell the overall story of cement. And I went and I I kind of did a little supplementary research and I. Um, I filled in things that I didn't uh, know about so well, and you know, I put that all together. Something similar happened when I was trying to understand um, textile manufacturing and how a loom works. You know, these were all things where I ended up writing these kind of longer form uh, pieces, and uh, they just came out really well. And they seem to be the things that got the most, um, uh, you know, the the most traction and the most attention from people, and so. Uh, I, I ended up evolving towards fewer longer form pieces, and I still let myself do you know some of the shorter ones you know, here and there that are that are more kind of brief comments and notes. Yeah, well, it's uh, I it's funny you bring up Alchemy of Air because that's one of the ones that I've read because that's the uh, the nitrogen one, right? Yeah, the story of the Haber Bosch process, which right. is the most underrated, I would say, unappreciated uh, industrial process uh, perhaps in the entire economy. Yeah, well, I mean, so I, I, after reading your post, I'd probably agree with that. You know, I was familiar with, you know, the nitrogen problem and nitrogen fixing through leaving crops fallow or uh, through beans or some sort of nitrogen fixer. But then, and, and, you know, I like kind of also knew about guano and how that was used as a fertilizer, but like to see how that tied together and then how it created this imperative to come up with like a, a a fertilizer that could be manufactured like that was really interesting to see that evolution and then to see how they solved that problem and i thought that was a very well written post so for any of your listeners who, who don't know what this is all about we should just give at least a little bit of a hook uh, yeah. to go investigate it um the the haberbosch process is what keeps half the world alive it is uh it is a process that takes nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas uh nitrogen out of the atmosphere and hydrogen typically extracted from water and synthesizes ammonia which is nh4 and ammonia then becomes the, is the, is the chemical precursor to a number of extremely important products uh including explosives and most importantly fertilizer so the haberbosch process is the source of synthetic fertilizer which drives modern agriculture and feeds the world. We would probably have something like half the agricultural capacity today, you know, or less if we didn't have uh, this ability to create synthetic fertilizers. And so it really is responsible for uh, keeping us all alive. Uh, it's been estimated that something like half of the nitrogen atoms in your body came through the Haberbosch process. And it uses something around 1% of the total energy of the economy. So it's yeah. enormously important, and the book is fascinating. It not only tells the story of this process, but the process was invented and, and scaled up by two uh, Germans in, in between the world wars, uh, one of whom was actually a German Jew. And so yeah. it tells about their struggles uh, in society and you know, how that played out for them in their lives and careers, as well as the story of this you know, fascinating scientific and technological achievement. So a very well-written book, The Alchemy of Air, highly recommend it. Well, I'll, now that you've given the hook, I'll put a link in the description to j your blog post and the book, so that way people who are interested can check them out. Great. Uh, so you have like a, you've got your list of topics that you're interested in, and it's pretty diverse. So I tried to grab a few that were just like all over the place. So you mentioned cement already, salt and spices, digital media, hurricanes. These are like seem very unrelated topics. So what drives your topic selection? Yeah, so I am looking to get a broad overview, as you can tell. Uh, I want to understand not just a few randomly selected grab bag kind of topics, but I want to get the overview of what, okay, what is all of this progress that we've made in the last few hundred years, or, or really since the beginning of humanity, but most of that has been made in the last few hundred years. And, uh, you know, how can we, I want to be able to 
at the end of the day, I want to be able to give a kind of a, a, an overview and a synthesis, an integrated package where the reader can walk away with an actual understanding of, uh, uh, of what this was. I think this is what many, many histories fail at. They give you many details and it all just, it all just slips through your fingers like grains of sand. Uh, and, and you walk away thinking, well, wow, I just, just read, I just heard or read a bunch of fascinating stories, but I can't tell you, you know, what are, if all the details leak out of your head, what was the point? What good is it to go study history if you can't remember anything? So I think it's incumbent on historiographers to, uh, to, to do something that very few of them do, just to put it together into a, synthesize it into a retainable package. And that requires saying what the big themes are, giving people a small number of big themes that they can kind of hold on to, but that together add up to the package. So the big themes I'm working with right now, and this may evolve over time, one, materials and manufacturing, two, food and medicine, three, energy, four, transportation, five, information, six, uh, what I'm calling management and organization, and seven, health and safety. Hmm. And so I think if you put these seven you know, big themes together, and they overlap somewhat, especially health and safety overlaps a bit with kind of everything else, uh, yeah. but if you put these big themes together, then I think you understand the, uh, you know, the overall story of at least technological and industrial progress over the last, uh, you know, over all of human history, but again, especially the last few hundred years. Yeah, one of the, as I was going through that list, I got to your uh, health and safety at the end, and I saw earthquakes. We just had the 10-year anniversary of the Haitian earthquake. And so one of the things I like to tell my students is, you know, in the Haitian earthquake, 200,000 people died. And it was big, right? Like that was a huge global event. A few weeks later, Chile had an earthquake that was 10 times more powerful than that one and less than 600 people died. Hey, this is the importance of economic development of progress, right? Like that, that difference was not because of the earthquake. It was because of how they were able to receive an earthquake and what their building standards were and all those different things. You know, until the early 20th century, in, in the U.S. And, and Europe, entire cities would burn to the ground on a you know, somewhat regular basis, right? You go back in history and uh, many major cities had, uh, you know, London, Chicago, San Francisco. They, you'll find in their history, oh, there was the great fire of 18 whatever or you know, 1906 or something. And right. you know, you'll find out like a third or a half of the buildings were just destroyed in the entire city. This doesn't happen anymore, right? And it's not by accident. There, you know, there are reasons for it. There are reasons, like you said, building codes and standards and improved technology. A lot of the fire uh, reduction, I think, was was really just building out of brick and concrete instead of wood, right? <laughs> but of course, you know, better, um, uh, but better you know, sprinkler technologies within buildings, fire proofing material, all, all kinds of things like that. And uh, yeah, I, most people don't appreciate how far we've come. And how much, how much we used to be at the mercy of nature, uh, and how uh, you know uh, today when you say nature or Mother Nature, you think of it. People think of a kind of a benevolent, um, you know, they think of kind of warm, uh, warm days, sunny skies, green pastures. Imagine running through a field of flowers, you know, yeah. and that's, that's nature, sure. But there's a lot of nature that's a lot worse than that. Nature is also disease. It's also wild animals. It's also floods and hurricanes and droughts and frost. It's, uh, it's you know, it used to be famine. It used to be that we there would be regular crop failures um, or, you know, semi-regular frequent crop failures that would lead to people to simply starve because they couldn't grow enough food. All sorts of things that we are just pretty much unknown, unheard of today. And because of this, without the history people just take these things for granted as if, uh, as if we've never had to, you know, deal with frost and deal with, with uh, crop failures and deal with floods washing out the bridge and deal with earthquakes destroying all our buildings and fires and, uh, and so forth. So all of that too is an achievement. And yeah. that's achievements I want to highlight in my work. No, I think that's great. That's one of, when you read these biographies of these great leaders, you often wonder like, you know, basically, if you were able to survive all the things that you those people went through, like you had to come out like 
ready to do something, right? So, so you look at like uh, you know, obviously Hamilton's popular ever since the musicals come out, and you look at that history, you know, everyone in his life is basically dying, his island's hit by a hurricane, and it's just you don't worry about those things as much in a country like the United States. You know, obviously there are other countries that are lower on the economic development or lower on progress. And they're, they're still worrying about those things on a daily basis. Yeah. yeah. When I wrote my uh, article on the history of smallpox, it was remarkable to me uh, how many famous people had, had survived smallpox. I mean, it's funny, you read something that says, oh, you know, almost everyone contracted smallpox. And so you were either, you either died from it or you became a survivor and then you got lifetime immunity. Uh, but, but it still doesn't click for you that that means that famous people you've heard about contracted it at some point. So George Washington, you know, caught smallpox when he was like age 19, I think, in the Caribbean or something or West Indies. Abraham Lincoln caught smallpox right around the time of the Gettysburg Address. Oh, wow. And I think right before perhaps the Emancipation Proclamation. So... You know, and this this is a disease that killed, you know, something between typically between fifteen to thirty percent of the, I mean, a fairly high mortality rate, right? Yeah. Um, and so you just think about how U.S. history, how world history would might have been different if just one of those people had, uh, you know, had not been a survivor. Well, I, and I guess you have the other counterfactual of how different would it be if some of those fatalities had actually survived, right? Like, what did we lose there? Like, what is your, what are your research habits? Like, what does your media consumption look like during the day? Like, how are you diving into these topics? Thanks. What does my media consumption look like? Honestly, it looks like way too much Twitter. Uh, Dude, that's my problem. That's, no, you were supposed to tell me, like, I don't spend any time on Twitter because I'm too busy working on this stuff. <laughs> No, this is, well, this is the difficult part. Twitter is part of my job description now. Like one of my, uh, I mean, I'm using Twitter as, a, as another outlet and uh, I try to, to, to post regularly about the kinds of things I'm looking into. You'll often see me uh, posting there, posting interesting little stories, anecdotes, charts and graphs, um, all kinds of things uh, at, coming out of the research before it all gets into a blog post um, mm. or some of it will never, it will get cut from the blog post. So um uh, I also take each of the posts and I typically turn it into a, a Twitter thread as well. So um, I recommend following me there uh, in part because my number of Twitter followers is one of my key goals for this year. How do I actually go about it? I have found that it takes me about three weeks to write a long form blog post of the type that I've been doing lately. Thought I could do it in two, but it's about three has seemed to be about what's comfortable. It seems that I spend about the first week just reading and researching often, you know, devouring entire books, uh, or maybe multiple books, sometimes uh, supplementing that with academic papers, uh, or just a bunch of internet research. And then uh, second week, I'll start drafting, typically realize is part of the drafting that I need to do a, you know, I need to do more research, mm -hmm. I'll do an outline or a, or a rough draft and realize there's some major holes there that I need to go fill in. And then, you know, natural questions will arise that I don't know how to answer, but they're part of the overall story. So then I'll go do supplemental research as I'm drafting. By the end of the second week, hopefully I've got a rough draft and then, you know, maybe put it out to some folks who are close to me for uh, feedback. A third week, I end up kind of making revisions, still doing follow-up supplemental research, um, polishing it, and then, you know, finally publishing. And then I'm kind of ready to, and then I catch up on a few things at the end of the week, and then I'm kind of ready to start the cycle over. That's, that's the habit I've roughly fallen into in the last few months of doing this full time. So you, so this is, do you stay pretty on topic during those three weeks or are you, ha do you have like a couple streams that are going and then you kind of, you kind of. Uh, yeah, I'll typically have some secondary streams. If nothing else, you know, I'll be, I try to make time every evening and, and on weekends and so forth for just reading or whenever I'm on a train or, or anything like that, I'll just, I'll just pull out a book. Um, I love Kindle. I love eBooks. I, I carry around a Kindle, you know, pretty much anywhere I go or I've got it on my phone. And so I can always be, I can always be reading a book. Um, and so sometimes I will be reading a book that just happened to interest me or something for a topic that I think I'll write about in the future. And so, yes, I do get this parallel streams going. So like recently, as I've been researching the history of infectious disease, uh, I also started reading David McCullough's history of the Brooklyn Bridge, which I'm almost finished with now. I'm on the last chapter. Uh, and that itself has led to some fascinating questions, which might make the basis of my next uh, investigation. So for instance, there was a, just a footnote in this book that indicated that in the 1870s, uh, there were 
roughly 40 bridge collapses per year in the U.S. Oh, wow. <laughs> About a quarter of all the bridges that were built during that time. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and, and things got a little better in the 1880s, but there were still something like, uh, you know, 200, I think, bridge collapses in, in that decade. This is an astonishing. I mean, that, that kind of blew my mind. I thought by the end of the 1800s, at least, we would have figured out how to build bridges. But apparently we didn't. They were still collapsing. We didn't know how to do the calculations. We didn't know how to protect them from wind or storm or, or whatever it was. I don't know all the causes. And so uh, now I'm just wondering, when did we finally figure this out and why did it take so long? Uh, this is the recurring theme of, of, of my work. Why did that take so long? Yeah. <laughs> why well, was it not until so late in history? One of, my, one of my most popular blog posts actually was when I asked this question about the bicycle. It, so I, say that was the first one that I ever read from you was, you know, why it takes so long to get the bike. That was kind of my breakout uh, post. It was the first one that hit like number one on Hacker News and really went viral. And uh, I just posed this question. It started out just on Twitter. I posed this question on Twitter. Why was the bicycle not invented until the late 1800s? Mm -hmm. You know, you'd think maybe we could have had bicycles in like the Roman Empire or something, right? The right. you know, like, obvious yeah. reason why not. It's not. It's not like the telegraph, for instance, where the telegraph depended on uh, an understanding of electromagnetism, of physics, right? And that breakthrough in physics didn't come until the 1830s or so. So it's not too surprising. Telegraph came along a couple decades later. But bicycles, why, why did we have to wait so long? And so I got all these replies on Twitter. Everybody had a theory. And it was really interesting how much speculation there was. And, you know, one person says, oh, it was... Uh, it was rubber tires, and somebody else says, oh, no, it was, uh, you know, precision machining for gears and chains, and somebody else says, no, no, it was the roads, the roads weren't good enough, and somebody else says, actually, it was horses, we had competition from horse, and, you know, and so I just, I'm like, okay, so many theories, let's just figure this out, and I dived into the actual history, looked at how, you know, when and how was the bicycle invented, and then kind of critiqued all the theories on, on that basis and came up with, with my own conclusions. So yeah, that's another another one of my most popular blog posts. Though. Yeah. So what can a student who's interested in progress, whether it's studying it or like making more progress, what should they be doing? Yeah, sure. Um, so I mean, if you're interested in studying progress, I would definitely say uh, study study the history, pick up, and and you'll probably have to study some things on your own, but uh, pick up some books. Uh, uh, you know, supplement your studies, go to my bibliography, there's a bunch of great books, and I kind of say which ones I liked the most. Um, but, you know, learn for yourself about some of the big developments in industrial history, because you might not get it from school. Um, if you want to actually make progress, uh, I, I still recommend doing at least some of that as, as inspiration, and as uh, so that you can see how, what is it like to be on the inside of one of these great projects that turns out to be history making, you know, how did it feel like? I think actually the most important lesson to learn probably is how, how uh, it was not at all obvious in, in many cases that you were onto something big. Mm. It was not at all obvious that you were doing something that was going to be great. It was not at all obvious that you were going to succeed at all and not simply, you know, fail and become a footnote in history. Yeah. Uh, many, many people criticized every major project right up until the time it was completed, even after it was completed, even after it was succeeding. Every project, every innovator, every great scientist, every breakthrough inventor, they all had critics. Uh, they all had people telling them uh, that you're doing it the wrong way. You'll never succeed. You're a fraud. You're a fake. This isn't working. You know, um, the Brooklyn Bridge. The Brooklyn Bridge is this, uh, again, I'm just, I'm just wrapping up reading this history of it. The Brooklyn Bridge is an icon, right? It's, a, it's like a monument. It's this beautiful piece of the skyline. It's, it's a piece of history now. And yet all through it, it was receiving criticism. Some people said it should never have been built in the first place. Some people said a tunnel would be better. Some people said it's going to cost way too much money. And it did, by the way, run way over budget, uh, as did many great projects. It turns out, you know, nobody really remembers, by the way, oh, that project ran way over budget. They just, you know, they look at the thing. The Sydney Opera House was another project ran way over schedule and budget. Today, you know, nobody thinks of it as like that expensive opera house, right? They think of it as that gorgeous opera house that's like on all the postcards. Right. Well, maybe don't. That's another lesson. Like maybe don't worry too much about about running waiver, but as long as you can keep getting funded, right? And guess what? We learned that lesson apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but you know, but right up until the end, people were criticizing uh, how the bridge was being built. They were criticizing the chief engineer, Washington Roebling, 
who uh, got who became disabled in in large part because he was down uh, with the men in the caissons underneath the um, underneath the river, and like a lot of the workers, he ended up getting uh, nitrogen poisoning, got the bends. They called it caisson disease, and so he ended up uh, being you know lar- largely physically incapacitated for a large part of the work. He's watching. Uh, he, he's watching the construction of the bridge out the window through his telescope, uh, from his bedroom window, from his from his home near the bridge. And there were people trying to kick him out, even until the very end. They were trying to remove him uh, from office, get him to like step down, retire, um, which he didn't want to do. So, you know, these things are fought and criticized and ridiculed, you know, right up until the very end. And sometimes even after you're done and you and you're succeeding, you're going to continue to have critics. And so I think that's a hugely important lesson for to learn for anybody who wants to go out there and do something great. It's not going to be a nice straight linear story like you know the capsule summaries that you get in the history, where first he set out to do the thing, and then he got the team, and then he you know found the breakthrough, and then it was done. Yeah. So you, 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 we tend to hear the linear stories because we we kind of want a logical connecting the dots of this thing led to that, led to that, led to that. And, and that is the most important part of the, the history to understand, but it's but we tend to histories tend to cut off all the side paths, all the detours, all the, the, the dead ends that people had to back up out of. You know, you, you you only get that when you go to the next level, go to a really detailed history. And that's when you learn how messy uh, progress is and how difficult it is. Oh, that's great. Well, you've mentioned your Twitter, we've mentioned your blog, um, anywhere else people can follow you or participate in what you're doing. Doing? Yeah, those are the best places. So the blog is at rootsofprogress.org. Uh, I'm on Twitter as Jason Crawford, and the blog uh, itself has its own Twitter account, Roots of Progress. And uh, on the website, rootsofprogress.org, there's a subscribe page that has other links to There's a Facebook page. There's a Reddit group uh, for the Roots of Progress and you know some other ways to follow. So check that out, and that's how to keep in touch. Great. We'll put links to all those below. Well, thanks so much, Jason, for joining us today on Market Power. And uh, hopefully we can have you on another time and talk maybe about one of these projects that you're looking into. Thank you very much. Uh, This has been a great conversation and I'd love to come back. If you're still watching this video, mad props to you because that is the longest video I have posted on my channel to date. If you're interested in more of these types of interviews, I'm going to post a few more as part of an experiment, so check them out right here. And also, please go check out Jason's work at The Roots of Progress. Support him, find him on Twitter, so that way he can keep moving forward and let it, keep giving us this great gift that he's given us. We'll see you in the next episode of Market Power.